Good morning. So good to see you. It's nice to be in the building. Uh, I'm hoping today I'm going to rescue for you um, your excitement about chocolate Easter eggs. Has, has anyone still got chocolate Easter eggs lying around? Is anyone doing that very good parenting thing where now and again you go to the kids' chocolate and you just eat a little bit more because you know that you don't want them to have too much sugar? <laughs> Is that just me? Is that just my issue? Great. Well, uh, in preparing for this talk, I got really excited about Easter eggs, and not just because of chocolate. We'll get to that in a little bit, um, but it's, uh, yeah, it's great to see you. It's great to be here. As Andrew said, we're talking about resurrection power. Uh, I hope you didn't miss Easter Sunday. Um, we're going to be uh, reading in a moment from John 20, so if you've got your Bibles, feel free to head there. If you haven't and you don't even know what a Bible is, well, thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining in. Hello to everyone online, and if you're just curious about who this Jesus fellow is that we're talking about, um, or you're in a good place, we're going to be uh, discovering more about him uh, and learning a little bit. It's good news this morning. Great. Well, let's get uh, stuck in. I, uh, I just want to show you a, a picture, actually, of some chicks. Look at that. Isn't that cute? That is a picture of some chicks in a uh, little incubator thing. They've just freshly hatched, uh, and there's some other eggs that haven't yet. Uh, and now we're going to read our Bible passage, and then I'm going to give you about 30 seconds, uh, possibly on your own if you're watching this online on your own or if you came on your own, but you might be sat with someone you want to talk about. But just to think about the link between the lovely chick pick and the passage we're about to read. Okay. Great. If we can have the reading on the screen, we're reading from uh, this chapter. Lord, open our hearts and our minds as we read your word together. Oh, man. On the evening of that first day of the week, that would have been a Sunday, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Christians. Well, he doesn't say that. The Jewish leaders at the time. That's awkward, isn't it? Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Or shalom. That would have been a kind of normal greeting uh, even today in the Middle East. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said to, to, to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. There we go. Straightforward passage. Why don't you just, uh, I'd love for you to just have a little think for 30 seconds uh, or chat if you're with someone. Um, 30 seconds about uh, what that picture and this passage might be all about. Have a guess, have a think. I'm going to give you 10 more seconds. If you're watching online, obviously you can just pause it and have 10 more minutes. That's, but that's cheating. <clears throat> All right. Time is up. Time is up. Did you figure it out? Just raise your hand if you figured it all. Great. It's well worth me carrying on then for a little bit. Um, great. I'm, I'm not actually going to tell you what the link is. I know. I'm just going to, that's, that's just the teaser for, that, for now. We'll get there. We'll get there. Um, but before, just, just a couple of pointers from this passage that I want to cover before I get into uh, what I feel like God wants uh, to do this morning. Um, uh, there, there's a question about being locked in. We've got the disciples in there locked in for fear of the religious leaders. They're wondering if the same fate that happened to Jesus in being captured by uh, the Romans and the Jewish leaders and put on trial and then killed. Maybe that's what's going to happen to them. Genuine, real um, fear and possibility. And that, so they're locked in. Uh, and Jesus comes. And where they've gone from three days earlier, absolutely shattered, so tired, exhausted with grief. It, talk, it talks in, um, uh, in another gospel. It talks about them being exhausted by grief. Now they're overjoyed. 
because of the risen Savior, this Jesus that they, were, they thought had died and had died, had risen again. And he comes and he, uh, he's able to overcome even the locked doors. Uh, and there's an encouragement. I'm not going to dwell on that. Uh, but it might be that at the moment, after lockdown, you still feel locked in. You still feel in your own faith journey maybe that you're stuck or there's stuff in your life where you've, maybe you've started to lock Jesus out a little bit. Uh, well, he's big enough uh, to physically come through doors, but he's also able to, to get over whatever barriers you might have otherwise put up. Um, interestingly, Andrew obviously already talking about sin being one of the greatest barriers, and we'll come to that. Uh, I just want to mention two pieces of the puzzle uh, from, from this passage. There's two pieces uh, that are mentioned. Uh, Jesus came and stood among them at first and said, peace be with you. Um, and that's, as I say, that's more of a kind of common greeting. But then after that, the peace be with you uh, is, is more of a commissioning. It's peace be with you. Go in peace. There's a kind of commissioning element. As my Father has sent me, so I send you. So there's the friendship. There's the connection. Peace be with you. Hello. And then there's also a command, an encouragement for us this morning. Peace be with you. Go, take the shalom that you've been given from me. Go and take it. Peace be with you. I also just want to quickly uh, um, point to the fact that at, at this point, there, Jesus is recognized or he shows them his scars. This is the risen Jesus. This is not... Um, a vision of, a, a, of something else. This is a real body that went through real suffering and real pain. Again, as I read that this week, I'm just so encouraged that we worship a God who lived a real life, who felt real pain. All the stuff that uh, is uh, some of the words that we've used for our Easter about betrayal um, and, and just feeling finished. All of those things were feelings that Jesus will have felt, but also the physical pain. It's interesting, this year we're just reflecting on our prime minister had COVID and was in a pretty bad way. Um, the queen is now processing real grief after 73 years of marriage. There's something about being able to recognize in a, in a role or in a person a, the reality of who they are when they go through suffering or pain. Maybe you felt more able to empathize with the queen over the last couple of days. So I certainly have felt that. <clears throat> Well, we serve a king, King Jesus, who similarly has gone through pain. I wonder if there's something of that in this passage that, is, that makes the, the disciples overjoyed. They have seen him go through the worst life could ever throw at, and now he's on the other side. Now, you might have gone through the worst life could ever throw at you this last year. Well, our living hope is that Jesus rose again from the dead, that he went through the worst and came out the other side. Now that is exciting, is it not? That is exciting. And remember, you can't whoop, but you can clap. Let's get a bit more Pentecostal if you want to. We can clap some of this stuff. How exciting. How exciting. Uh, and then he says, as the Father has sent me. Well, how did the Father send Jesus? John mentions Jesus being sent by the Father 38 times. So the writer of this gospel is making a real point of the fact that Jesus was sent by the Father. He mentions it 38 times, and here he's saying, as I was sent by the Father, now I am sending you. You are the sent ones. And we get to include ourselves in that now. We become part of the sent ones. Strangely, often when we, when we I'm aware not everyone in here will, or watching this will be Christians, but when we say yes to Jesus, yes, I want to model my life around you. I want, I want you to live in me. I want you to take my mess and the barriers from within my heart away. Thank you for the cross. Thank you that I can have a relationship with you. I want in. We often think of that as like an arrival. Uh, imagery that indicates like a coming of home. Uh, I finally made it. Uh, the beginning of the relationship with Jesus being that response to his invitation. And we've said yes. But actually, it's a little bit more complicated. It's, it's not like you've just been invited around to someone's garden for a barbecue. Yes, we can do that now. Uh, but it's, it's, that, it's more, we can also be part of the invite team now. We're part of the welcome team for heaven's banquet. That's why one of the reasons that Jesus uses banquets a lot to talk about the kingdom of heaven, because he's saying, yes, you, you know you've got a place, but there's a lot of seats around this table 
I want you to start being on the welcoming team. And so that's what he's doing here in this moment. This second peace be with you isn't just a, hey, how are you doing, peace. It's a, go and take this peace. Also, take the forgiveness of sins. Now, I'm not going to get into the complexity of that, those couple of verses because uh, I still don't fully understand it. Uh, but also, but the reality is the forgiveness of sins is something that has been attained by Jesus Christ on the cross. The forgiveness of sins is powerful. It's been attained by him, but we get to proclaim it. We get to make it public. We get to go live with this most ex- exciting of things. We get to say, look, that brokenness, your mess, the stuff that you feel grieved about from your own choices and decisions, you can be forgiven. You can be freed from that heavy weight that is burdening you. You can be free from it. We get to proclaim that. We're not the ones that achieved it, but we get to proclaim it. That's what this passage is talking about. As Jesus says, there's a, there's a mission. You are the sent ones. That, that's where mission comes from. You're going to be sent. You've not arrived. You're being sent. And so we come back to the chick pick, the baby chicks. Um, you might not know this about chickens and little baby chicks, but apparently I've come to understand One of the dangers of um, chicks hatching in the incubator is that you remove them from the incubator too quickly. So it's quite a struggle. Some of them are just flat on their face, exhausted after getting out of this shell. Uh, And then slowly but surely they come come around. You've got to give them a bit of water within the first 24 hours. I know, this is really helpful for you, isn't it? Um, uh, But also, one of the reasons that you don't remove them from the incubator too soon is because their noise, the noise they make, will encourage some of the other eggs who haven't started to hatch yet. I'm, I'm going home now. That's just... <laughs> How fun is that? If, if, if all we're supposed to do here on earth is say, I agree with you, yes, Jesus, then just teleport us up to heaven right then. You guys, me, my family are supposed to be making some noises around some other eggs. We're supposed to be declaring the truth about who Jesus is and being good news by the power of the Holy Spirit. We've been breathed on, not so that we can be some really pleased little chickens eating our Easter eggs, but so we can make a noise that's going to help other people who are struggling to find life. Life on the other side. How good is that? How good is that, that we get to be those chicks? I don't want God to remove me from this incubator we call earth until I've made enough noise around some other eggs. As you have sent me into the world, so have I sent them into the world. That was Jesus' prayer earlier before before he died in John 17, 18. Jesus breathes on them, his Holy Spirit. Now, it's a little bit complicated because uh, we, we often see uh, Acts 2 actually as, where, as the giving of the Holy Spirit. That's the moment that we, we often think of as the birth of the church. So, so did God breathe, on the, breathe the Holy Spirit on them and commission them in that way when it was the 10 of them uh, as in the passage that we're looking at today? Or, or was it in Acts later on? Well, yes. I'm just going to I'm just going to say yes. I'm comfortable with it with it being both. What I'm not uncomfortable with though is the idea of 10 people being empowered by the Holy Spirit, breathed on with the life from Jesus and then taking that empowered presence of God to go fishing. Just to apply it to their their old life. If you read further on in John's account, that's exactly what Peter does. They just haven't figured out the incubator stuff. And so they get back in a boat and do what they used to know how to do. But just now they're taking the Holy Spirit presence of God into their work, just their place of work. And it's fruitless. And so if you read and look on, Jesus gathers them for breakfast again. It's another another of the resurrection stories where it's not just a vision. It's a dynamic body, the dynamic resurrected body of who Jesus is meets with them, eats with them and commissions them again. We are not supposed to be churchians. We're called to be Christians, 
to following Christ's example in being out there. This is a scattered Sunday. I'm reminding of us why we're supposed to be scattered. Because I don't know that there's that many eggs in this building or watching online. But I know that there's a lot out there who are facing some real difficult stuff and would love to know some life. And they need to be alongside us as we proclaim the goodness of sins forgiven and a, and a, and a Jesus who has resurrected us. I was speaking with someone this week who, um, who was talking about their, their witness to other people and um, they're, they're having a really good time at the moment just seeing the power of God at work uh, that's, that's caused this person who doesn't have faith to go, I'm going to have to come to church with you, aren't I? This, I mean, this, this is so weird. Um, just the, the miracles that are happening, the faith journey of this individual is drawing someone else. There's, an, there's a chick in an incubator thing happening there. But she said, I'm not really an evangelist. I just, I, I just, I just know how to love people and, I, and tell my story. <laughs> well, great, that's it. You don't need to be an evangelist. Just love people and tell the story of why you've got hope of what, what, when you felt betrayed, when you felt grieved, what you've gone through, and how you have an anchor in a person who is Jesus, who isn't just alive today, but was a real person. And you have to figure out whether that real person died and rose again, because it matters, and it's massive, if we can grab hold of that truth. Um, I've, I've said this before, um, but I enjoy saying it, because there's a very famous preacher, I think his second name was Lockhead, but he talks, he does this preach called, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. And he talks about the, the pain that we're going through, but resurrection is coming. I want to remind us, it's Sunday, but there's Fridays happening all around you. We have the resurrection life of Jesus in us, and there's loads of people going through the grief and the pain and the heartache of a Friday, where they don't recognize of the Jesus who died, and they haven't seen the scars, and they might find it amazing to know that there is a God who not only made them, but has suffered like anything in a way that they could really relate with and relate to. I, wanna, I don't want to take too long, because I just think, uh, I, I, I'm hoping, there's, there's more that we could unpack from these verses, but I just have such a sense that God wants to rescue some people through this message. He wants people to come out of their shell like chicks stuck. There's a lot of people around us who need extra strength to come alive on the outside. So we're talking about love has won this Easter. It's one of the things that we've been looking at. If we could have that slide up again, that the love has won. People feeling disowned, judged, all sorts of things. I can't even see that. I, Andrew, I thought it was your age, but I can't see that. It's Betrayed. You. It's behind you. Oh, I love a little bit of... <laughs> oh, no, it isn't. Oh. The theatres aren't open, but we're doing it here, aren't we? <laughs> love has won. So, uh, here's some things that I'd love to, for you to do if you feel stirred a little bit about... A, expect the power of the Holy Spirit to be at work. But you need to position yourself in the right ways, in the right places. So I'd love for you to pray. Specifically, just begin to pray around your locality. Now, that might be rural, and so it's like a, a, a long walk or a drive. It might be, you, you might be in town, and it's just, it's just, you're just walking around your, your close or your flats, whatever it is. Why don't you just say, once a week, I'm going to start praying. Everything starts in prayer. When it comes to fruit in the kingdom, pray. Begin to pray because your heart will begin to grow then. And you might become more aware of the needs around you that you can be good news to. But position yourself. That's one of the focuses of Scattered Sundays, that we're not having a strong focus on our own gatherings here, but being sent out, being the sent ones, scattered in different places. Obviously, that doesn't have to just be Sundays, but make sure that you are positioned among other people in your workplaces, but also with your families. Where are you making time to sit and eat and enjoy hospitality with people who are still on a journey of faith? So pray, position yourself, but I also want to just challenge you about preparing. Some of us just don't know what, we don't feel like we're, 
we can raise Jesus as a, as a conversation topic. Or when people ask us questions, we don't, we don't really feel very equipped. We'll get, get hold of some material. This is, this is a, a really helpful book, Jesus Christ, The Truth by J. John. I've been reading through a little bit this week. Um, and you can get other little, little books. You might want to just stretch yourself in your own understanding of who Jesus was. And you might want to do some prep. That's fine. But don't feel like you have to have all the answers. Just go out and love people and tell them your story. Hear their story. Can we just have the picture of the chicks back up? Thanks, Cheryl. Uh, I would love us to do some, some praying just in, in this moment. And, and I know in, in some ways I've, tried, I've simplified this particular passage, but I think that it's, be, it, it's because this is the main, the main thing I think God wants us to do this morning. So I'm just going to ask that we leave that up for a, for a minute. I just, want, I just want you to feel stirred about why you are here on earth. If, if you already have a faith in Jesus, you might just want to meditate on that picture for a minute. You might be able to name some of those other eggs that are around you already that you just are longing for to start to, to hear noise and want to break out <clears throat> and find new life. Or maybe just start praying now. You might be on a journey and you, and you don't, you've never said yes to Jesus, well, you might want to say a first yes to him. You might want to invite him. You might want to come up and have a conversation with me afterwards. I'll give you that book. You can have it. Explore the person of who Jesus is. I'm just going to pray that the Holy Spirit would breathe on us in this moment again.